Yeah. Oh, good, mate. Love nice. What are you, 21 handshake? Yeah. <laughs> mate, I noticed you've, um, you've been back in the game getting tattooed again, Paul. Tell me about that. Might be a nice way to start this conversation. Yeah, well, I had, I had a tattoo done 27 years ago. What year was that? 27 years ago. What, 94? I'm just trying to work it out. Yeah. But that's exactly when I started tattooing. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I got this tattoo that I thought was really cool at the time. It turned out to be something called a tribal brand, which is, you know, the tattoo of choice for the Aussie Bogan, so I was kind of ahead of the curve there. You know they're cool again now? Like, um, they've sort of hit that ironic stage now. It's fun to get a tribal tattoo again. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah everything comes back around, huh? But anyway, I, I don't know. I've got it in my head that I'd get some tattoos um, based on sort of sort of sailor tattoos, really, mm -hmm. to fit in with the theme of the show. Mm -hmm. and, um, and Ralph and I have discussed the idea of having wallpaper, which and the wallpaper is is uh, printed off uh, some watercolors that I did. And so one of the images mm -hmm. I literally have tattooed on the forearm. Yeah, Ralph and Ralph. And then I decided with the tribal tap, which I really hated, I'd get a full, full um, square inch ship over the top, <laughs> so it kind of hides it a bit. And there's another painting that's part of the show, but not hung on the walls, which is of a siren. And so, and that, and I had to say sorry to my tattoo mate because I said, look, I want you to do something that looks a bit shitty and amateur. Because <laughs> that was the look I was going for. Oh, we, we love that. We tattooers love that. Uh, give me the bad tattoo look because uh, just the pressure's off there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't stuff this one up. <laughs> I want it to look like it was done by someone for their first time. So, what's with the ships, Paul? Tell me about the ships. So, the idea behind the ships was really this idea that, you know, I've read stories of that the indigenous Australians, the first thing they saw of, of, of us, of the white fella, were the sails on the horizon. And you can only imagine how much that sort of freaked them out, spun them out seeing that. Mm. And they, they, they had a name for it, which I won't say, out of respect for their language, um, but it really translates to white ghost or white ancestors or even dead white. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that got me thinking that that image of those ships on the horizon would really be a fantastic motif for a, a series of paintings. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's interesting that you won't say the word, um, but you are happy to involve yourself in painting the images. Is that is, is involving yourself in those stories, is that something that's problematic for you? Is it something that gives you sort of pause for thought or is it something you just do uh, because you can, because you want to. How does that work? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel I can paint these stories because I don't think I'm painting their story, in, Indigenous Australian story, First Nations story. I feel I'm actually painting a shared story. Right. Here we are, 250 so odd years later, and uh, I think if we really want to find any headway with any sort of reconciliation and coming together as two different peoples, we need to be open enough and brave enough to have a shared conversation. Mm -hmm. So this is the conversation from my side, or yep. being, you know, being a white fella. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel like I've, I'm talking for them, I'm, I'm talking for me about what, what I imagine it would be like to see that. Mm -hmm. mm. So you're kind of at that point of sort of first contact as opposed to stories from before. Yeah. You know, I mean, because yeah. it is something that's going to sort of cause people to think, I guess, really. It's gonna, I mean, not everybody's gonna understand that. I mean, not everyone's always gonna get that, but it's a, must be nice to have the opportunity to explain, explain it today and express it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, it was it 10 or so years ago, I did have a show at Woodland Gallery, which was shut down briefly because I inadvertently upset some of the uh, local indigenous people. Yep. Um, uh, interest, interestingly, there were two voices from the indigenous local community. There were those who were saying, great, Paul, it's great to see someone from the white community painting about this. Mm. And there was the other side saying, we're not happy, we feel like you're all trying to tell our story. Yeah, we well, have to listen to all of those voices, I guess. We and do. Um, not, well, just be mindful, I guess. Be mindful, I think. It sounds like you are. Yeah, well, it, it actually did make me think much more deeply about it, and I'm, I'm, I'm now more careful how I paint the stories. Yep. Um, but you know, really, some of the most interesting art happening in Australia right now, uh, people like Tony Elbert, uh, Daniel Boy, you know, what you might call urban indigenous artists who, who paint about those, paint about what it means to be an indigenous Australian 250 years later, but still the ramifications of that 
taking over their land still mm. affecting them as, pe as their community and as an Indigenous person. Mm. And so I think it's right and proper that there are also some artists who are not Indigenous to also be painting about those stories. I think, I think we can both paint the stories mm. from totally different perspectives um, and be respectful of each other and, and that's what I'm trying to do, yeah. Mm. Well these, I mean, there's a painting straight out of the sort of Western Canada, really, aren't they? I mean, they're very much you know, um, traditional is not the right word, and conventional sounds nasty, but there is a lot of the Western painting tradition and convention that's in these paintings. Yeah, and I mean, that's something that I've always drawn upon as well. Yeah. I, I liked it, especially with my colonial figures. Mm -hmm. The whole thing with the colonial figure is I'm taking the piss out of this pompous British bloke standing on Australian shores, you know, posing for his sort of, you know, mm -hmm. portrait to be paint, hung on his walls of his, you know, family at home back in London. And bloke couldn't look more out of place if he tried. Mm. And, uh, and I find that interesting. Yeah. I'm playing with that idea of what civilised and the uncivilised. The Brits thought they were the civilised people. They mm. nearly fucking starved here. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. If it wasn't for boats coming from the, from the England bringing supplies, they wouldn't have made it. Yeah. Here's the indigenous Australians living it up. Yeah. Fresh fish, vegetables, you name it. And how stupid were they? <laughs> yeah. The, the, the colonizers, they, they couldn't see that these, these people were actually living in harmony with this natural Australian environment in the most civilized way you could imagine. Because mm. they'd done it for 60,000 years and they hadn't wrecked the place. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got 200 years and we're doing a good job of that. We're doing a good job of that, yeah. yeah right. So tell me more about the actual painting itself. I mean, there's a sort of variety of styles. When I saw this show in the flesh for the first time, I was struck struck by that. I mean, a lot of folks these days imagine that when you've seen a painting um, reproduced in a photograph, for instance, that you have seen the painting, you know. Yeah. You always have people ask me, have you got paintings in your phone? You know, I'm like, well, you're going to have a painting in your phone. Um, and when I saw these in the flesh, there's a lot of different kinds of paint. There's um, some actually really subtle stuff, which is sort of amongst a cacophony of quite sort of thick and pasto paint. Yeah. And uh, is that something you sort of consciously pursue? Is that where you Every picture on its merits, for instance. Well, you know, over the years of painting, you start to build up a repertoire of techniques. Mm -hmm. And so if, if I want a clear, starry night, I, I need, I feel I need a very sort of smooth background. Mm -hmm. So I have technique with the palette knife to make it very smooth. And then in front of that, I'll put chunky roughed up waves mm -hmm. and, and gnarly trees or a colonial figure. Yep. Um, yeah, and so then, yeah, I'll go on. In terms of palette knife, then how often do you pick up a brush these days? Very rare brush. Right. Sometimes finger, rag, but it's mostly palette knife. I mean, you, you look at these paintings mm -hmm. and there'll be smooth areas and they'll be chunky. And it's all done just with different ways of handling the knife, basically. Yep. Yeah, um, right. yeah, and this painting behind you is about three paintings in. And that's another thing that happens is I never ever fully give up on a painting. If it hasn't worked, goes against the wall, a year later I'll turn it around and go, oh, you know what, I, I, could, I could do this to this painting, I could do that. Mm -hmm. And then so you put thick on top of thick and then you, you get this whole different effect. It's really chunky and rough and, and lots of room for sort of serendipity and chance, as Francis Spoken would say. Yeah. And I, I, love, I, love the, uh, I love the element of chance. And oh, I think with palette knives really open up the elements of chance quite a lot. Well, it's a very hard thing to do. I mean, um, anyone who's ever tried it, I have. It wasn't for me. is a fairly kind of cosmetic similarity. There are a lot of other things that these shows have in common beyond that. I mean, um, I think we discussed that you'll use as much paint in one painting as I'll use in, a, in two years worth of painting. Yeah. Um, but uh, beyond that, there are, there's a lot of other things that are going on. I think thematically, um, I've always sort of painted tattoo designs in a way, and, and these are nothing if not tattoo designs. Yeah. Um, there's also a, a good amount of um, a nod to bad taste art, kitsch, sort of 60s and 70s kitsch. Um, can you tell me about your relationship with those kind of, yeah, that, that you might see them in a, 
you know, you know sort of hipster bar these days. You can certainly see them in some of these lounge room back in the 60s and 70s. He talked to me about the, the, the relationship between these paintings, which are anything but kitsch, and those. Yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've always been drawn to those works for some reason. And in fact, one year I ended up working in the Archibald called 13 Noahs, which was Noah Taylor painted on 13 of those exact sort of paintings that I've mm. found in various junk shops. Uh, but with the sailing, the, there's a lot of kitsch art mm. about sailing. And it's, and it's also very much, um, you know, it's a theme that's been run, that's run through tattoos for many, many years. Mm. And, um, I just love, I actually love looking at black and white photos of American sailors, World War II, sitting on these ships and tattooing the shit out of each other. Mm, good. And that was a huge inspiration for, for this work. And I, I, I looked at lots and lots of old paintings of ships and amateur paintings of, and drawings of ships um, in old sailors journals. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that, that, that fed deeply into, into this show. Well, kitsch is the sort of contemporary romantic, isn't it? I mean, that um, there's a lot of art which these days tries to be a more sort of conceptual headspace thing. Yeah. And um, to have something which is felt or emotive is sort of considered taboo. Um, I don't know why, it doesn't ring true for me, but it is something that if you do it, you, have, you do it at your peril and you are open to sort of criticism for a, a romantic, you know, but these are very romantic paintings, yeah. you know. I mean, it's interesting about the tattoo thing because if we, if Captain Cook hadn't visited the South Pacific, we wouldn't have the word tattoo because he, he borrowed it from, yeah. it came from locals down there, yeah, yeah, yeah. just a sort of um, Mount Maori word. And uh, it's the kind of cross, so there's guess that crossover between Western culture and we also wouldn't have tattooing in the Western world had sailors not brought it back. Yeah. You know, and that um, crossover between sort of European culture and, and, and the sort of colonial culture is exactly where a lot of this yeah. springs from. So you think you're kind of right at the nexus there, I guess. I think one of my great loves about what you do is you've taken painting on felt, which is really the king of the kitsch paintings. Yes. And you have raised it up to a, a, a form of high art, I think. Oh, thank um, you, mate. I, I, you have to be involved in, the, in a, the mess of that stuff. I don't, I don't think that avoiding I think most art these days is kitsch. Most 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 Western culture these days is kitsch. Oh, that's you know what I mean. It is. It's it's it is. That's just the stuff. And trying to avoid it is admirable and but fraught. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to sort of make something that doesn't involve itself in the mess of um, sort of everyday um, commercial appeal, I guess, is the thing. Yeah. But I think the easiest way to deal with it is to just walk straight through it. And is to involve yourself in it, but try and find a way to transcend it, you know. Yeah. And uh, how we do that is not really entirely clear to me, but I think that it's fun trying. I agree. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's every painting is a is a thought experiment, and each painting is actually to me is like a little world. Mm -hmm. And every time you're in front of that, you're creating this little world. And while you're doing that, you're thinking about all these things, all those influences. Uh, filtering through somehow, mm. coming through your brain, in, through your hand, onto the canvas or the felt in your case, mm. and uh, yeah. Yeah, the operative word there being somehow. Mm. I mean, I don't really attempt to consciously understand what it is that I'm doing. I mean, you can involve yourself in stories of sort of colonialism. I think you have to think your way through that one so that you're not, so you are engaging in a, in a story which is shared and not somebody else's. Yeah. I think you have to consciously think your way through that. And, uh, but once you have, I think that the, what occurs to you as image making, was a good image for instance, or, or how to put the stuff on the surface, is um, all sort of intuitive and it comes from somewhere else that you don't understand. It, yeah, it does. And I mean, I, I truly believe that when you do a good painting, some little bit of magic's happened. Yeah. And I'm someone who doesn't believe in magic. <laughs> oh, I do, jeez. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do. strong in your work is, is this idea of that it's mythology, this works feel like there's, there's a myth behind them. Can you um, talk to that? I guess 
usually it is a more traditional, universal, established myth. Quite often I will work with Greek mythology or with um, Christian mythology. And this time I guess it's more personal mythology, but there is still a little bit that's bound up in those old sort of classics, you know I mean? I rely very heavily on sort of standards and understood universal themes. Yeah. And um, through those universal themes, I think sort of paradoxically, you find something which is particular. I think that when somebody sets out to make something new that's all about them, they end up falling, leaning back on cliche quite a lot. Whereas if you embrace the sort of universality of mythology, you do end up finding yourself within that more so than if you hadn't done yeah. it. You know? Certainly, your paintings often give me a sense of the dark carnival. Yeah. And you're obviously attracted to those sort of figures. Well, yeah, it's sort of what I grew up with and it's what I'm interested in. I always think of it as just making, finding a way to paint the thing that you just want to paint. I mean, I like painting cats and people and animals. I like painting people and animals. If anyone asks me, what do you do? And I say, I like paintings. And they say, what are they like? It's the worst question you can ask a painter, of course. But I say, oh, look, the dark pictures of people and animals. So it's just a way of shutting it down. So yeah. um, if, I, if I can find an excuse to paint people or animals, then that's what I'll do, you know? And more increasingly, it's pictures of myself. I mean, portraits is a fun game, but <clears throat> self-portraiture more so because all paintings are self-portraits. I mean, this is a room of self-portraits. Oh, that's, exactly. that's what we're in, do you know yeah, what I mean? Exactly. And in a way, some of those old ships that are in the shore will be self-portraits, right? Do you know what I mean? They're self-portraits, and, sure. and they are. And if you pretend that your painting is actually about somebody else because it's of somebody else, you're kidding yourself. So I always found, and I've had good success with self-portraiture. And it's a, <clears throat> you can also take liberties with yourself that you can't oh, take with other people. Absolutely, you've got total freedom to just totally trash yourself. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> Whereas, you know, I've, I've done that occasionally successfully with very close friends, and I always let them in on the gag and tell them how they're the butt of the joke, and uh, in, in, in the most dignified way. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but you don't have to have that conversation with yourself. It's kind of, you know, all bets are off. Exactly, brilliant. Mm. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so that's mythology, that's uh, sort of plays a part. Um, just things I'm intrigued by, I mean, I've been intrigued by the, the Joseph Merrick, the Elephant Man forever since I was a kid. And I watched that old film um, with John Hurt. And uh, it's an awful story. And I think that um, you need to just acknowledge those things and not think about it too much. I don't really need to explain why it is that I've, I've returned to those motifs. They sometimes make for odd paintings, but um, if it strikes me as a good idea, then I will do it. And at the end, sometimes you'll make a shitty painting, but um, you'll only know once you've made the painting. Yeah. You know? And there's a carnival aspect of merit as well, of course, because he, That's right. you know, sadly was, the only way that he could earn a living was to, yeah. was to live amongst those kind of carnivals. But I haven't painted carnival with Joseph Merrick. I've painted, you know, portrait. You painted a beautiful Rembrandt-like portrait. Yeah. Eh? So, so I, I will let the audience know that I bought that painting from you. Well, it makes me happy to think it's gonna hang there with your, yeah. Junk, junk shop like the other things. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it'll hang in the lounge room with my collection of, slowly growing collection of little pieces from other artists. And uh, yeah, I'm sure there'll be many a question of what is that? <laughs> yeah, <'cause> what? <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> why, why not? I say. Exactly, why not? Why not do? That's probably a good place to wind up. Why yeah, not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Thanks very much. And thanks to Nando Hobbs. Thanks, folks. And yeah. um, let's hope you come and see the show in the flesh, which is the only way to see decent painting. Yeah.